So, I said earlier, over these past uh, couple of weeks, we've been thinking about some of the names of God that we find uh, in the Bible. And I got a row for saying last week that David was a really good name again. Uh, so I won't say that this week, although it really is. Um, but the names, in, certainly in the Old Testament, were much more important than um, perhaps for many of us nowadays. Two weeks ago, uh, the name that we thought of was uh, Jehovah Rohi, which means the Lord my shepherd. And we read the, the 23rd Psalm and it saw that the shepherd provides and cares for and nurtures the sheep. And then last week it was Jehovah said, Can you? Which means the Lord my righteousness. And, and at communion, the whole point is that we cannot come to, uh, to God. Uh, in any merit of our own, in any righteousness of our own, because we don't have any. And so Jehovah said, Kenu, the Lord our righteousness, He gives us His righteousness. He makes us good. Today, the name that we're looking at is uh, Jehovah Nisi. Reading was uh, about a battle between the Israelites and the Amalekites. And after at that battle, Moses, uh, we're told, built an altar, and we're told he called it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. Now, it's fairly easy to understand why you might need a shepherd to guide, to protect, to help you. We get that. Uh, we understand that the Bible talks about uh, people as being sheep uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. So we get that kind of analogy. It's also fairly easy to understand that we need God to make us good because we can't do that uh, ourselves. But why on earth would we need God to be some sort of flag? Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly know for me, sometimes we get to a point with something and we just feel like giving up. We've just had enough. Things get hard. Nothing is going the way uh, that we want it to. Maybe it's something like losing weight. Somebody was saying to me uh, yesterday uh, about somebody who had been dieting for their wedding and uh, did two and a half stones to lose before the wedding. And everything was going well, uh, except they had a wee note saying, of the two and a half stones, only three to go. So maybe it's something like losing weight that's a real struggle. Maybe it's uh, being a better parent. Maybe you're struggling about staying in your job or, or being more faithful in reading and praying. There's something and you're just, it's just a struggle. Struggling with thought and you're thinking maybe about throwing in the towel. You know uh, you want to lose weight, but the biscuits, they know your name. And when you walk past the cupboard, this wee voice goes, eat me, eat me. And it's a struggle. Maybe you're just finding life is hard and you need a banner to look to. You know, Jehovah Nisi is our banner. You might sympathize with what Paul wrote uh, to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 7 verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do but what I hate, I do. And that's a struggle, I think, that all of us who try to follow God would understand. We know what we should do. We know what we're expected to do, but somehow it's the opposite that we end up doing. Maybe in wanting to be a better parent, what happens is, you're all smiley. And then the teenager does the teenagery thing. And all of a sudden you want to rip their head off. Because that's what happens with teenagers, apparently. I wouldn't know. I'd never have children like that. Yeah. But, but, but it's the thing that you, you don't want to do that you end up actually doing. I'm so glad to know that I'm not alone in those feelings of struggle and not being able to do what I really want to do. Here's this man in the Bible, and his name is Moses. I think he can relate to that struggle. 
And so what we're going to do this morning is to look at the first 17 chapters of the book of Exodus. And in about three hours from now, when I'm finished, you can all go home to a slightly burnt lunch. You're laughing, but there's, no, there's always that hint of, oh. <laughs> Moses was the child of a slave. And in those days, Pharaoh had said that every male child had to be killed. So his mother put him in a basket in an effort to protect him and put him in the river. He was subsequently found by an Egyptian princess who took care of him in the palace. He was well educated in Egypt, but he also had his mother's influence in his life because God worked out that she was the one who would be his wet nurse and would care for him. As he grew up, Moses saw that the Israelites were suffering and he tried to help, but he tried to do it in his own way. And he ended up killing an Egyptian. He had to run away and go into the desert. He ended up being a shepherd in the middle of nowhere. And then one day God said, I haven't forgotten you. There's a calling on your life, Moses. And you don't get to run away. And in this bush that appeared to be on fire, but was not being burnt, God called to Moses. And he went to see what was happening. And God said, I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I'm aware of their suffering. I'm aware of what they've been through. I've heard their cries for help. And now, Moses, you go and you set them free. And Moses went, yes, absolutely. Actually, no, he didn't. He did what I would have done. Who, me? He made all sorts of excuses as to why it couldn't possibly be him. And God said, Moses, there's a calling on your life. Go and tell Pharaoh, set my people free. So, in context today, if there was a country uh, where you wanted to help the people, you would send in an army. Y you would have planes and bombs and guns, and, and you would try and free the people that way. You'd have a strategy. You'd have a plan. You'd have all the stuff, all the resources ready to go, and you'd send in the military. That wasn't God's plan for liberating his people. There were no laser-guided bombs. There was no elite forces. God sent a man with a stick. And when you say it that way, it sounds a bit feeble, really. Take your stick, Moses, and go. That stick eventually becomes known as the staff of God. And with it, Moses performed amazing miracles until at last Pharaoh lets the Israelites go. However, it's not too long before they decide, hang on a minute, I don't actually know how to make the tea or do any dishes, therefore let's get them back. So they chase them and they get uh, very close to the Israelites and Moses standing at the sea and the Israelites are all complaining, why have you brought us here to die? Why did you not just leave us alone in Egypt? And God says to Moses, Moses, just relax. Or at least nowadays he would, you know, if it was a film, just relax, Moses, it'll be fine. Hold out your stick and see what happens. Now, when God says that kind of thing to you, you have a choice. You can either hold out the stick or not. And if you don't, you're never going to know what happens. But if you do, if you get to that point and God is saying to you, hold out the stick, Moses did. And the water parted. And the Israelites got to walk across on dry ground. And they were saved. Because Moses was obedient to what God had called him 
to do. The miracles didn't stop there. They're in the desert, they're hungry and thirsty, and they're complaining about having no water. And God says, Moses, take your stick and go and hit that rock. And Moses has a choice. What does he do? Well, he was obedient. He took the stick and he hit the rock. And all on this gallons and gallons and gallons of water poured out of this rock. Enough for all of the Israelites to have the water that they needed. Well, just imagine. Here's Moses. And miracle after miracle after miracle with the stick. And people begin to go, oh, look, here comes Moses and the stick. Moses has got the stick. Something's going to happen. (laughs) Because that's what we do. In combat, a banner is really important to a soldier. I suppose it's it's important for, for a couple of reasons. It stands as a symbol of who you are, of which side you are on. It's a rallying point when things are crazy in the middle of a battle. It's something bigger than the soldier, him or herself. It's something bigger than life. It symbolizes a cause. It's that cause that motivates them to fight. It stands to inspire. The army's still there. The leaders are still there. The people are still there. The flag, the banner is still flying. It inspires people. And soldiers will fight for something bigger, better than themselves. They'll be inspired to do things that they they wouldn't naturally want to do. Nobody wants to run into a battle. But you do it because there's something outside you that's valuable to you, that's important to you, that's significant. And it inspires you to get into the battle, to fight, and not to give up. All of us face battles in our own lives. And they're different for each of us. And sometimes we look for different things that act as a banner for us as we go into those battles and endure what we have to face. For some people, maybe it's as simple as your favorite sports team. That's your battle. They're losing. They're about to be relegated again. Do you know that kind of stuff? But they've got a badge. They've got their colors, they've got the strip and all that kind of stuff. And it inspires you to do something that you wouldn't normally do, like paint your face, dress up, and act stupid. But that's what inspires you to go out and support them and to keep supporting them, even when they're rubbish. I was going to say some of you here would know that, but anyway, let's not go there. But you understand there's something bigger. Maybe it's more serious than that. Maybe it's your family. Some of you have photos at work or or with you in a bag or your wallet because your family inspires you to do what you're doing, to work the hours that you're working, to do the job that you're doing, to save in a particular way. Maybe your banner is a religious or spiritual symbol like the ichthus, the Jesus fish that people have in their cars sometimes, or a crucifix around your neck. Whatever it is, a banner is a powerful thing. It's an an inspiring symbol. But most of all, I think its importance is that it helps us to stay in the fight. So my question for you today is, what is your fight? What is your struggle? What are you dealing with right now? What is your greatest battle for now? Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's just absolutely everything and you don't see a way through. Maybe you're ready to throw in the towel and to give up. Whatever it is, all of us need a banner to look to, something to inspire us and to keep us going in the midst of the battle, to keep on keeping on. 
And so here's the point of the story that we find Moses in this battle. And it's, it's suddenly, suddenly they're in a battle. We've not heard any of this before. And all of a sudden, the Amalekites have come and they're in a battle. And sometimes the things that we struggle with are sudden. They just happen. And all of, all of a sudden, without our, our, our planning or thinking or anything else, we're in the middle of this thing and it's just too much. So here they are. They're at war with the Amalekites. No idea why. Just suddenly they're fighting. And here's Moses. He uses all these years of being in the wilderness. He uses all the experience that he has, all the military strategy at his disposal, and he says to them, here's the plan, guys. You go down into the valley and you fight the Amalekites. I'm going to take the stick and I'm going to go up this mountain. And they all went, yay, Moses, woo, great plan. Great. Really? You go down and fight and I'm going to take the stick up the mountain. What on earth? was he thinking? What kind of plan is this? But that was the plan. That was Moses' big strategy. I'll take the stick and go up a hill. Well, that's what he did. Off they went. And then the Bible tells us this part of the story. I don't think it really happened, perhaps the way that Moses expected that it would happen. I think Moses maybe ran out there thinking, every time I've used this stick, it's been immediate. It's just happened. It's been brilliant. So when I go out here and I hold up the stick, the Amalekites, they're all just going to drop dead. I think that's what God's going to do. Because it's immediate. It's always immediate when I use the stick. And he gets up there and he holds up the stick. And they're still fighting. And he holds up the stick. And they're still fighting. I don't know how long you would be able to have your hands up in the air for holding a stick. But after a few minutes of being like that, even with a tiny stick, <laughs> it's going to get sore. Maybe he hadn't quite thought through the plan. And when he's holding the stick up, they're winning. And when his hands fall, the Amalekites are winning. And so his two supporters come and they hold his hands up. We need people who will do that for us. We need people who will help us in our calling with God, who will support us and encourage us, who will hold our hands up and enable us to do what God has for us. Sometimes we kind of do that. We charge into things in our own strength. I don't know if you've ever done that. Something's happened, and maybe, it, maybe it's more a man thing, I don't know. I don't want to be sexist in any way whatsoever, but you know what, I like to fix things. People will tell me things and I go, right, okay, here's what we'll do. Sometimes you don't need to do anything, but listen. But well, I want to do things, you know, because that's what men do. I want to do things, let's do something. And you just rush in and you bring in. And it's me doing it. I haven't stopped to think what should happen next. And sometimes we're expecting God to act instantly and immediately. Sometimes we think that God is at our disposal when we're asking for instant miracles. And I think Moses made that mistake that day. The Bible says as long as Moses held his hands, they were winning. They were inspired. They could see the banner. They could see the stick. And it inspired them to fight. Imagine doing that for eight, nine, ten hours. Even the other hands, the supporting hands, would be tired by then. But they came and said, Moses, we're not going to let you down. We're not going to let you fail. We're here to support you as you lead these people. At the end of the day, they won the battle. Moses got what he had hoped for, and the people got what they, they wanted. But it wasn't quite the way that I think he hoped it would happen. And I think there's a valuable lesson in there. 
God doesn't actually work like a microwave. Sometimes He works like a slow cooker. It takes time for preparation, for simmering, for waiting, for listening. Where God has to work things out for us and teach us lessons as we serve Him. And so at the end of the day, Moses, when the battle was over, in Exodus 17, 15, says he built an altar and he called it Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. There's something significant about that fact that he's coming to be the Lord is my banner. It's not the stick. The stick is not my banner. The Lord is my banner. At the beginning of the story, there was nothing about God saying to Moses, okay, Moses, here's the plan. Moses, hold your stick out over the sea and watch it. Moses, go and hit the rock and watch it. He had been told, and here he says, I'm going to take the stick. God hadn't told him that. He just decided it would be a good idea. And here's what I think happened. I think they had become so enamored with the stick, with the tool that God used, that they had forgotten the miracle worker. They had seen the miracles, and they had fallen for the stick, and they had forgotten that it was God who was behind it, and without God, the stick is just a stick. Do you have a stick? Do you have something that you're looking to to solve your problems? Because if it's not with God, it's just a stick. Is there something that you're looking to to inspire you? Maybe it's your family or success or financial freedom or some sort of form of independence. Whatever the banner is, it could be a perfectly good, perfectly legitimate thing, but if it's not of God, it's just a stick. If it's not Jehovah Nisi, it's just a stick. Moses' stick is long gone. In fact, all of the things that God used to show that he was with the Israelites are gone. The stick's gone. The tabernacle's gone. The Ark of the Covenant's gone. The temple's gone. None of them exist anymore. If you could could really find Moses' stick, I'm sure you could sell it for quite a lot of money. But it's just a stick. Moses started out the day looking to a stick. And in the end, what he realized is that it's about God. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. So knowing that is all well and good, but what about me now today? What does that have to do with me and my everyday life? How is it going to help me? Well, in the midst of the battles that you face, you need to remember the Lord is your banner. The Lord is the one you should look to for inspiration, for support, for encouragement. The Lord is the one who will be with you. The Lord is the one who will support you. The Lord is the one who will provide for you. There is somebody out there who wants to inspire you, and it's God himself. What better cheerleader could you have? And not only does Jehovah Nissi inspire you to never give up, he empowers you to victory. Jehovah Nissi empowers you to victory. Psalm 60 verse 4 says this, but you have provided a flag to show your faithful followers where to gather to escape the enemy's attack. There's a flag that we can rally around. When we feel that we are at our weakest, not only will God inspire us, but he will give us the strength to carry on. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. He's the one to turn to. And you might be thinking, oh, well, it's all well and good for you. You've got a calling. You're a minister. Well, there is no doubt that if you are around church for a while, you will meet some of the nicest, kindest, most helpful people you could ever hope to meet. Sadly, you'll also meet some of the most unpleasant people you could ever hope to meet. Of the people who trained 
with me. One is no longer in ministry. Three are currently off on long-term sick. And many others have struggled with issues in their congregation. Having a calling does not exclude you from any of this. All of us will face times when we feel like we've had enough. All of us will face times when we feel like throwing in the towel. Of course, having a calling helps. Of course it does. And that's why when you're training for ministry, they ask about it over and over and over again because do you know what? When you get to the point where you're thinking, I've had enough, you can say, but I've been called. This is what God wants me to do. This is where God wants me to be. And that's not just for, for me. Whether you're you know, a teacher or a hairdresser or a banker or a whatever, knowing that that's what God has called you to do and where God has called you to be is a huge help. But it doesn't take away the difficulties that you'll face. So let me ask you today, what is your calling? What is your calling? Maybe you're saying, I've got no idea. What I want to suggest is that in a broad sense, every single one of us are called to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. All of us are called to that. And I'm suggesting that maybe part of that calling for you is in overcoming the battle that you thought of when I asked you, what's the toughest battle in your life just now? Because I suspect that these battles that we face come from our enemy to stop us doing what we're called to do, which is to lead people to follow Jesus. What's your calling? It's to lead people to follow Jesus. Don't give up the fight. Don't cave in. Remember, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, is my banner.